Um, thank you everyone for joining us for our fifth uh, journal club. And so as usual, I'm going to remind you that we're using this uh, hashtag to keep the conversation on going online and um, yeah. So my name is Judy Kichai. I think you've heard me speak if you've been on our previous journal clubs. No financial disclosures. Uh, remember we have an ACR engage forum dedicated for resident and fellow section. But most importantly, I want to tell you that, uh, you know, we have the ACR meeting coming up in just a few weeks. So we're going to be there during the resident fellow section, ask us any questions. We're going to have a presentation and we really want to make sure that we're doing the best thing for the residents and fellows. So we want to hear your suggestions. We've been giving us a lot of emails and that's really helpful, a lot of places for improvement. And also just saying that you're learning something which is always helpful to keep moving forward. And so we hope to see you at ACR, say hello. And um, yeah, we want to get away with good ideas for making this better for the residents. So this is our advisory council, I think. Um, I think we'll see a lot of Danotis during the next, um, you know, the next meeting when he's going to be chair for the resident and fellow section. I think also Patricia is applying for the education liaison, focusing on informatics. And I, I think uh, so we'll see a little more of our AI advisory council more on this um, next meeting. So please, if you see any of us, I think Shaheen may be studying, but for his exam, but if you see Kevin, me, Lindsay, Patricia, Dan, please say hello and give us your feedback. Thanks. And so, you know, jumping on today to our topic, uh, I think if you look behind, we've, you know, we started from basically what's the role of the radiologist in AI, you know, will you be replaced? Uh, we've gotten increasingly a little bit more technical as we've got, you know, we've moved along. Um, you know, the last journal club we looked at does deep learning, you know, all the techniques, you know, does one size fit all, like how do you approach a, a problem in machine learning? We had a guest speaker on the previous one, you know, Timmy to speak about how the, she approaches her data. And, um, you know, previous ones, we've also had just different perceptions from, from CART um, and also the multiple panel uh, presentation looking at ChexNet. So I'm hoping that, you know, during your time that, you know, um, one trick that I use is use Google Scholar to track papers that I like and, um, you know, consume them when new, when they're cited or other new publications are made related to that paper. And Google is pretty good at doing that. So like ChexNet this year has had several papers, you know, published because I think from the baseline of our discussions, you can keep growing your knowledge and uh, kind of understand. The JSCR had a specific, um, you know, special issue on AI. I know the SIM society is just going to have the same. And so just spend some time reading this paper so that you kind of, you know, get into the mode of at least speaking, you know, the AI language, even if you're not actively practicing it. And also if you're, uh, you know, a resident or a radiologist out there who's working on machine learning, please join us. We have a small you know, kind of small group of people who are actually doing the first AI version two course, you know, with Rikisha and Alexandre. And that's really amazing because we all end up learning even more, you know, just beyond the general club. Anyway, to today's topic, we have uh, machine learning in radiology, applications beyond image interpretation. I'm personally very excited about this topic because, um, you know, the idea of, you know, replacing radiologists, I think that's really pretty far-fetched to be honest. But, you know, places where you can have a winning combination between human and machine, I think is going to be beyond image interpretation. Our speakers today, they're going to introduce themselves in detail. We have Dr. Paras Lakani, who had an amazing ARRS session. Uh, I did not attend, but I, my friends really tweeted about it. And I, hopefully there'll be a recording of that session so that, you know, we can share it on our future channel club. And he's from Jefferson University. And Dr. Eugene Kim, who's from Nuance and gives amazing talks and then we'll have uh, 30 minutes of discussion and questions but please keep typing your questions in the chat as they go along so that i can uh, um, ask these questions uh, remember guys we have when i say guys i mean both men and women but um we have this youtube channel where you can just go back and rewatch some of our previous sessions and i think that's really that's been very helpful and also share it with your friends because it's also a good way to catch up and so that you're all not always lost when we are 
discussing these topics. So as always, you can give me feedback and suggestions uh, to the whole team. Uh, that's my email and my Twitter handle and our hashtag, which my council members are actively checking. So we're going to go ahead to Dr. Paras. Catherine, do you wanna help us change the screens? All right, great. So hopefully, so this is, uh, I'm Paras Lakani. I'm a radiologist at Thomas Jefferson. Uh, thank you, Judy, for the introduction. And I'm gonna be going over this um, article uh, machine learning and radiology applications beyond image interpretation. And so this was a collective effort um, with a lot of uh, fellow radiologists as well as uh, researchers. Uh, and the idea was actually not mine. Um, and I started working on this with this team uh, before I started doing any machine learning research. This was in 2016. And this was an effort by the um, American College of Radiology um, Innovation Council, and this was one of the topics that we were assigned to sort of talk about, and it culminated in this paper. And so um, I'm not sure who came up with the idea, but it was one of the ideas that uh, we were working on. And so it was probably either Keith Dreyer or Matt Hawkins, because both of them have talked extensively about it. And uh, so I led the group. Uh, I was lucky enough to, to take part in it. And, um, you know, after many phone calls and meetings, it, it culminated in this article. And interestingly enough, even after we published it, we felt like the article was outdated. There were just so many new things coming out. Uh, it was really uh, an interesting um, thing to work on. But the crux of the article was this, is that we felt like that machine learning was more likely to impact radiology um, outside of image interpretation before we um, saw what we call the machine radiologist implemented in practice. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over the crux of the article, which is sort of going all, over all the use cases, um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Wujin to, to, to discuss it. So first I'm gonna start off with machine learning isn't new. I think a lot of you already know that, and there are many types of machine learning uh, besides deep learning. There's you know artificial neural networks, linear regression, support vector machines, k-nearest neighbors, random forest. These are just some examples. Uh, machine learning dates back to the 1950s. But why are we talking about machine learning now? I think uh, we thought of three big reasons. Um, there might be a few more, but we have a lot of data. Um, we have more processing power that's particularly good for deep learning, which is GPUs. And then we have more advanced, deeper algorithms um, and optimization to the techniques for training. Uh, so I'm gonna go over a lot of the use cases um, that was presented in the article, but uh, the first use case is study protocoling. So as a radiologist, we routinely protocol hundreds of exams daily. At, at our institution, it is 100, like more, more than 100. So this is an example. This was taken today from Jefferson. These are the amount of outstanding protocols from our protocol list. I mean, you can see there are hundreds of protocols that we have to do. In fact, there's so many that we don't, we don't even do them most of the time because we're just daunted by this list. And, and we do them when the tech calls us. Um, and, you know, it's actually not are an easy task. It involves a lot of pieces of information, uh, clinical notes, EHR information, lab values, prior imaging, the ordering script. Uh, but uh, over the course of training, I think radiologists become really good at this and they can protocol an exam sometimes in seconds or, you know, but, um, So the idea is, if we can do this, we can reduce interruptions, we can increase efficiency. If a computer can do some of this work for us, that would be great. Uh, and so this is an example, this is taken off of the article. Um, and so a study is ordered, it goes to a, schedule, a scheduling system, which uh, may be in your wrist or your EMR. A radiologist will view that uh, scheduling system or, or protocol list, a protocol work list, in tandem with the machine learning protocol assistant. And the, the idea is maybe an AI engine can protocol some of the studies uh, on their own, you know, without a radiologist, and maybe for the tough cases, a radiologist can kind of can take over, or a radiologist can work with the machine learning assistant just to expedite this process. So, um, these are two studies that were recently done where they use machine learning to facilitate study protocoling. And uh, the first study looked at the indication section of uh, MRI brain radiology reports, and they were able to use machine learning to select the appropriate protocol about 90% of the time. 
a similar study uh, was done for MRI abdomen and pelvis uh, reports, and they actually used IBM Watson's framework, and they were able to get uh, a model that was about 93% accurate. So I think it's very promising to use machine learning. And this is just looking at the radiology clinical indication section, but if you extended it to the whole EMR, I think you can get probably more accurate uh, models. What about hanging protocol? What about hanging protocols? So when I started at uh, Penn, uh, when I did my training, uh, a typical body MR had around five or six pulse sequences or five or six series. And now at Jefferson, a typical body MR is like more than 25 series. This was actually taken today uh, from Jefferson. This is one body MR case, and it takes us about three to five minutes to hang one of these studies. Um, and our vendor-based solutions are just not very effective. So if a, an AI system can do this for us, we can save three minutes per case, which is really helpful. So this is how a workflow could work. This is uh, taken from the article. So we can have a machine learning hanging protocol assistant that can pull cases from the packs. Um, an optimal hanging protocol can be displayed, and then a radiologist can look at it and then report it. Um, based off of my own machine learning research, I find that AI is really good at differentiating different pulse sequences or different body parts. It actually does a, a good job with this more than um, classifying, classifying findings. So I think this is something that AI can handle um, pretty well, and I'd love to see it um, you know, in our workflow. Another topic that we talked about in the article is improving image quality with deep learning. So this concept is called super resolution. Uh, this is considered sort of a ho holy grail in computer vision. And with deep learning, uh, many people believe now this is possible. So actually there's been some really good work already where you can take a low resolution input. So this is a picture of a butterfly that's at low resolution and you can map it to a high resolution output um, using an autoencoder, uh, which is a type of deep learning. And so if you extend this principle to medical imaging, you could do something like this, right, where you can take a noisy low-dose CT scan, and using an autoencoder, you can map it to a regular-dose scan um, that's higher quality. And as long as you give it enough training examples of low-dose and regular-dose pairs, it can learn the mapping, and then you can extend it to new cases. Um, there's already some nice research being done in this. Um, and in fact, there was a study, a survey-based study done uh, last year, was presented last year at SIM um, by Dr. Cross, where they surveyed 60 radiologists, and the radiologists felt that the um, artificial neural network reconstructed images were of similar quality to the ground truth um, in, in most cases. So this is really encouraging. And right now, um, just even with traditional reconstruction methods, you know, we can achieve like one millisievert like CT chest scans. Well, imagine with deep learning, are we going to get to, you know, 0.3 millisievert, 0.1 millisievert? I think um, that might be possible. And, the, and for pediatric imaging, I think this is really important. What about for MRI, right? You can, t you can do the same thing. So you can take undersampled MR data. So this is an example of an MRI with 80% less sampling. And with deep learning, you can reconstruct it into a corrected image that is very similar to the ground truth. And so the idea is I can save, I can acquire images faster. Now, we would need to clinically validate this, but I can tell you that a lot of groups are working on this right now, um, and they're getting really exciting uh, results. This is just another example. Um, this was work that was done at a Europe um, at NYU. And um, if you compare traditional reconstruction, this is an, these are MR images of the knee, to deep learning-based reconstruction, there's a huge time savings, and you can get comparable quality images. Um, this is work that was done at uh, the Harvard group by Dr. Rosen's lab that made it into Nature recently. Um, really exciting work with the same idea where they use deep learning to reconstruct images um, of similar quality to the ground truth. And in this case, they use 15 times less sampling, four times speed up, and you can basically get the same image. Um, so this is going to be really important because if we can acquire an MRI in 10 minutes as opposed to 30 minutes, um, there's a huge return on investment and uh, cost savings. What about for PET imaging? 
same idea. So this is work that was recently done by Dr. Zaharchuk at Stanford and Dr. Zhu, um, where they um, took low-dose PET scans, where they gave up to 200 times low, um, the dose for a PET and they were able to reconstruct an image that's similar to the ground truth. Now, again, a lot of this has to be clinically validated, and uh, I heard in clinical trials they're going to be actually starting with half dose rather than one two hundredth of the dose, but, um, but the idea is that you might be able to do something like this. And so the implications are in pediatric imaging, you don't have to give a full dose. Um, maybe you can do faster scans with less dose. So it's uh, very exciting. I even heard this research group talk about doing screening with pets, something you would never would talk about if you can do one two hundredth of the dose. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting concept. And again, this is using an autoencoder. Um, actually, you know, more specifically, they used a GAN, a generative adversarial network. So if I can map low dose to regular dose, can I map you know, one image or one modality to another modality. Actually, you can. This is called image translation. And again, this uses an autoencoder. This was work that was recently done um, where they mapped an MRI to a CT. And they showed that the CT images that were reconstructed by the deep neural network resembled the ground truth. Again, it, it would need clinical validation, but it's sort of an interesting concept. Um, can you do that with PET scans? Sure, you can take CTs and corresponding PET images on a PET CT, and you can map the two. This was using a GAN. Um, and so they could create basically a virtual PET uh, just from the CT data. This is just another example. So just basically training a CT to a PET scan, you can create a virtual PET. Um, you'll notice here, if you look at this image, you can see there's a hot spot in the left hepatic lobe, and then on the corresponding CT, there's a you know abnormal lesion. Um, this was work that was recently published a few months ago, and they found that the SUVs were actually similar on the virtual pets to the ground truth pets. Um, there are some problems with this approach um, that I'm not going to get totally into in this talk, but um, I think it's an interesting concept, but I think you would need to train this on a huge number of examples. Um, otherwise, you might get some problems with your reconstruction. Uh, and uh, uh, but. For this talk, I won't go into all those details, but I think it's a really cool idea. So the other thing we talked about in the article was using machine learning for uh, radiology reporting. So this is one potential use case, right? You know, we could generate an unstructured report uh, in the reading room, and we can use AI to automatically structure that report, and we can create different views of that structured report for different People. So we can have a structured report for the patient, a structured report for a surgeon, or a structured report for, let's say, a cardiologist or a primary care physician. The idea is different people might be different, interested in different aspects of that report, um, or they might the readability might be different. So the patient report might be at a different reading level, for example, than that for the primary care physician. So with AI, you can actually do this. Um, someone just has to train a system to do that. Um, what about just classifying radiology reports? You know, we talk about uh, AI for classifying images, but you can also do it to classify the reports themselves. This is work that was done at Penn by Dr. Chen, and uh, they took a large corpus of radiology reports and they classified them. These were radiology reports in the oncology setting, and they classified them into progression, improvement, stable disease, or no cancer. And then they trained uh, a number of machine learning models, and they were able to get accuracy around 90% using the mach these machine learning models for putting those reports into one of those four categories. This is not using deep learning. This is using traditional machine learning. So I, I, I'd be curious to see if those numbers could go up with sort of a deep learning approach. But I think the results look very good. Uh, one other thing we talked about in the article was tech, text summarization. Uh, so we have so much information in today's electronic health records, and in, even in radiology reports, the idea is if we can summarize what's relevant, that would be really helpful. So this is actually take this screenshot is taken from Google, um, where you can use TensorFlow um, to text summarize. TensorFlow is a machine learning framework, and uh, this is just an example of taking a sentence and then sort of summarizing the gist of that sentence. Uh, the use cases in radiology, maybe we can automatically create an impression section from 
the bulk of the radiology report, or we can summarize all of the data in prior radiology reports or in electronic healthcare records um, to what's important to me, you know, as a radiologist or to any clinician. So I think this is a huge um, area to work on. What about optimizing scanner utilization? So it turns out that in particular MRI, sometimes um, the scanners sit idle between patients. And the reason is, what if a scan that was supposed to happen in 45 minutes only takes 30 minutes, right? And then you have 15 minutes before the next scan begins. Um, so there was a study that was done at Stanford where they used neural networks to determine the optimal time slot per scan. And they actually found out that um, you can reduce cost and do more scans per day if you use the neural network to sort of figure out what scan to do when. Um, I think it's kind of an interesting concept, and it used multiple input parameters like scan protocol, patient age, um, you know, and various other things. So it's, it's something interesting to look at. Uh, what about scheduling pa patients and staffing optimization? So radiologists sometimes are overstaffed and we're understaffed. And it's a, it's a complex, uh, there's so many factors that go into it, depending on the time of day, uh, day of the week, coverage location, are you covering EDs, inpatients, outpatients, the complexity of the exams, uh, what modalities you're reading, your referring clinician practice patterns. Um, so maybe we can use machine learning to help solve this problem. Um, we get patient no-shows in radiology. Can we use machine learning to predict this? Actually, there was a Kaggle competition for patient no-shows, not for radiology, but um, that was in non-radiology. But this is an, an interesting problem. What about billing? So um, we don't often talk about billing, but it's very important. Right now, um, some, we look at um, our electronic healthcare records and radiology reports um, those are two important things that go into radiology billing. Here's an example. So a knee x-ray has four CPT codes. If you don't properly document the views, you have to code for the lowest um, level. Or if you forget to put IV contrast or the proper radiopharmaceutical dose, that can affect billing. So people do turn to um, various processes to improve radiology billing. Uh, at Jefferson, we actually use a manual review process. Um, we outsource to a company that does it. Um, but a lot of practices are using software for this, and um, some of that software is based off of rule-based approaches where they look at the reports. Um, but people are now turning to more sophisticated approaches using AI and NLP to look at radiology reports to improve billing. And you can extend this to non-radiology as well. What about image quality? So right now, our x-ray tech, let's say they're going to take a portable uh, x-ray on a patient, and the x-ray looks like this, where the left chest is missing, right? And sometimes we get these images at the work uh, in the reading room, and we call the tech and say, hey, can you repeat the study? But with AI, ideally, that tech can get instant feedback and take a proper image from the very beginning. Um, in fact, ideally, the, the x-ray machine should have a sensor telling, you know, you know, where to place the patient with respect to the x-ray scanner to get an image that looks... Um, that has proper coverage from the very beginning. So, um, and in fact, vendors are already working on this in the in the um, in the X-ray space as well as um, in, in other aspects of radiology. Um, I'm going to talk about image search. So, with deep learning, you can do reverse image search. So, the idea this this is from Google. Uh, so, you can take an image and you can drag it into the search bar. So, this is an example from uh, Google, and then you can actually do a search. That way, so rather than typing in abdominal radiograph, you can literally drag a picture of the abdominal radiograph. Uh, and so you can do this in radiology, and this is actually one company offering such a solution where you can, you know, drag an image supposedly into a search bar and search your entire packs for similar images. Um, so you can imagine this could be used for uh, teaching files or decision support. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential in this. Uh, one other use case for AI is quantitative associations. So well, this is one example. You can simulate a DEXA score from a CT. So uh, I know one vendor does offer, so actually a few vendors offer the solution where you can take a CT. This is a CT of the abdomen and pelvis. Um, I can then map that or train it uh, to learn the T score or the DEXA score. Uh, and 
Um, maybe you don't need to do a DEXA scan. So that's sort of the idea. And you can extend this to other things like coronary calcium score or other sort of quantitative values. But maybe I want to take that further and I just want to predict mortality, right? So this was a study done by Dr. Oakton Rayner. Um, last year was published in Scientific Reports where his group um, just wanted to predict mortality from CT chest exam. So they took 48 uh, you know, CT chest exams divided into those that uh, I think uh, had mortality within five years and those that didn't. And they actually found that you can get a reasonable accuracy just from the CT chest data alone. So I think people are going to start looking at this. And then radionomics, that's another big topic. This is just one study where they um, looked at low-grade gliomas and you can predict IDH1 or isocitrate dehydrogenase grade just from deep learning with pretty high accuracy. This is a study um, from Dr. Erickson's group at the Mayo Clinic where they looked at 1P19Q chromosomal deletions of low-grade gliomas and they using deep learning and got uh, a really accurate number, uh, much more accurate than traditional approaches. Um, brain tumors are of particular interest because uh, ideally you don't want to have to biopsy these. And then lastly, and this is the last thing I'm going to talk about um, in regard to image quantification, um, is segmentation with deep learning. Um, segmentation refers to tracing out organs in uh, 2D and 3D or lesions in 2D or 3D. So the idea is I can get surface areas or, um, or volumes of organs and lesions. And so the radiology report of the future is going to have these volumes as well as reference values. Uh, you're going to see maximum size, density, lesion segmentation. So each lesion is going to be segmented. This is all possible with deep learning. The way it works is you will have an, there's two different ways that are popular. You can use a fully convolutional network, which is an autoencoder. Um, the way these work is you have to train it on the original image and then a hand-drawn segmentation map. So you can see here that someone hand drew in the cat and hand drew in the dog. And if you give it enough training examples, it can learn how to automatically um, recreate that segmentation mask uh, using deep learning. This is another segmentation network called a UNET, which is a type of fully convolutional network. In this case, it's being used to segment out the buildings from satellite imagery. And again, someone had to hand draw in the segmentation mask and then it, and you give it enough training examples, it can automatically learn how to do this. So in radiology, we might see this fully automated at some point. This is from the liver tumor segmentation challenge and there are a number of segmentation challenges. Another one is the brain tumor segmentation challenge where we're gonna have a deep learning system automatically segment out these liver lesions and the liver as a whole. And you're going to see this extend the lung nodules and you know pretty much everything. So I'm going to conclude with that, and I'll take it over to Wujin. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, again, my name is Wujin Kim. I'm Moscow Skeletal Radiologist by training. Currently, a uh, Chief Medical Information Officer at Nuance Communications. So for my part, I'm not going to have any slides. I'm just going to talk actually for about about you know for the next 15 minutes or so, um, as uh, to review the article that uh, Paris just talked about and give you my perspective on the article. So first of all, thank you for having me be a part of this month's AI Journal Club. It's my pleasure to review this JHCR article on machine learning and radiology applications beyond image interpretation. Now, I've known PARS for a long time, so inherently, I admit there is a little bit of bias there. But seriously, I'm really glad he and his colleagues wrote this article. Back in December of last year, I wrote a blog entry for the ACR Data Science Institute titled uh, Beyond Interpretation, where I talked about how AI will do more than identify findings to increase radiologist value. Now, with so much media attention and many startups focused on using AI to identify findings within medical images, it's easy for those of us in the radiology profession to have what I call a tunnel vision about AI in our field. 
if you read much of what's out there written about radiology and AI, most of them talk about the capabilities of AI when it comes to making findings within images, specifically image classification tasks using deep learning, as you've seen in uh, previous um, AI journal clubs. And when you attend AI-related scientific sessions at conferences, you see performances of one algorithm after another, talking about how well they perform compared to radiologists. And finally, when you walk around the exhibit halls and visit um, AI companies, you notice a great majority of them focusing on image interpretation using AI. Sure, I get it. It's much sexier to come up with an algorithm that can detect, classify, and quantify brain tumors than, say, predicting patient no-show rates. Now, this article starts with a brief yet solid basic introduction to machine learning and deep learning. To understand the hype surrounding the use of AI in radiology and why there is so much focus on image interpretation capabilities of AI, you do need to understand where that hype is coming from. Um, Parsons didn't mention it, but it, when you look at the article, uh, it talks about the ImageNet challenge. Now, the only correction to the article I would like to make here is that I believe the competition began in 2010, not 2008. But putting that minor point aside, the article correctly attributes the, attributes the breakthroughs uh, in AI through deep learning in 2012 via this contest. It's also the performance of these algorithms at certain image classification tests beyond human performance level that has led to the fear factor of AI replacing radiologists, which is an entirely separate topic potentially uh, for a later date. Now, in 2014, there was a JACR article titled Delivery of Appropriateness, Quality, Safety, Efficiency, and Patient Satisfaction by Bowen and Group. Now, in the article, the authors introduced a concept called imaging value chain, modeled after Michael Porter's well-known book, Competitor Advantage, Creating and Sustaining Superior Performance. Now, Porter's book introduced the concept of the value chain as a, and I quote, systematic way of examining all the activities a firm uh, performs and how they interact, which is necessary for analyzing the sources of competitive advantage. Now, translating that concept into radiology, Bowen and Group's imaging value chain is a close loop that goes from patient to referring physician to appropriateness determination and patient scheduling to imaging protocol op optimization to imaging modality operations to interpretation and reporting to communication and back to the referring physician and the patient. While the article we're reviewing today may not directly refer to this concept or the article, but if you look at the use cases uh, in radiology beyond image interpretation section of the article, you will notice that Paris and Group cover these imaging value chain elements and more. For the review of this article, I wanted to frame the use cases this way to give you a greater context of the work Harrison, um, his team did to show uh, it is beyond a listing of use cases. And I think it will also give you the readers greater appreciation for the use cases that they describe. Now, if I, AI is to be used within radiology to truly bring value, it needs to touch on many points beyond image interpretation. And I think that's why I like this article a lot, and I think this is why this is an important article. How many of us, those of us who are radiologists, when we were residents and fellows, spend time during our rotations protocoling cases, either the day or several days before? And how often do we get interrupted asking for protocols during the day repetitively? I mean, you saw that screenshot from Pars. I mean, radiologists do spend a tremendous amount of time protocoling cases. Now, when I was at Penn, I had to create a work list designed to protocol cases up to seven days in advance because if the patient arrived, and we determined on arrival that a different study should be done, even slight changes like giving contrast, the patient would wait literally hours before a new approval would come through. Now, you can imagine how frustrated you'd be if you were the patient. To help illustrate this, imagine, let's say you went to a restaurant for your 6 p.m. dinner reservation, right? And the restaurant said they needed to give you a different table because the original table wasn't quite right for you. And as a result, you wouldn't be seated until, say, 9 p.m. Sounds ridiculous, right? Well, this is exactly what some patients experience, and this is why I think this use case is a terrific one for AI. 
Now, I like to help people understand the pain points through different illustrations. Imagine this time, what would it be like if you have to adjust your seat, seat belt, rear view mirror, and wing mirrors on your car every 15 minutes while you're driving? Now, that would drive you nuts, right? Well, radiologists do something like this every single day. Parson Group discussed the hanging protocol use case, which you saw in this presentation just now. Also citing how a survey of radiologists indicated that creating pain protocols had the highest perceived impact on productivity, and for that reason. Recently, Dr. Keith Dreyer uh, shared 10 reasons why there is currently limited use of AI in clinical care. And one of the reasons was currently there are no successful economic or business models. An AI company can have algorithms that can do great things and can have really high accuracy, but if the radiologist or the hospitals don't buy them, well, that company cannot survive. Wearing a vendor hat for a second, when I was running Montage Healthcare, a startup in search and analytics, and now working for Nuance Communications following the acquisition of my company, I cannot sell our product simply by showing what great features it has. I have to demonstrate value. That involves not only improved outcomes and quality, but also reduction of cost and financial ROI i.e. like it or not, you have to talk about money. I mention this because the use cases described around faster MR scanning time, staffing optimization, patient no-show predictions, and billing um, that person group uh, described in their article all have potential financial ROIs that, have, that may even be greater than some of the AI models used to make image interpretations. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with natural language processing, but did you know that it is actually under the umbrella of artificial intelligence? Now, empowering NLP with ML, machine learning, can have many benefits as shown in the article. The patient would love to get radiology reports that they can understand. And as a radiologist, I can tell you I would love to get externalization of EMR and prior radiology reports. Now, one of the other reasons Dr. Dreyer gave as to why there is currently limited use of AI in clinical care was challenging healthcare regulatory hurdles. And this is especially true for those AI algorithms that have to go through FDA clearance. However, looking at these other use cases in the article, uh, a lot of them have far fewer uh, such regulatory hurdles. Now, what I hope to see resulting from this article is that more people using AI, uh, to, uh, more people are using AI to tackle these other use cases. Now, if you're listening to this and are interested in going into AI medical imaging, by no means am I discouraging you from working on using AI in image interpretation. If you're going, if you're doing it already or are interested, that is terrific. And you know, as there are plenty of findings and diagnoses that can be worked on. However, if you want to do something different that may have high clinical and operational impact with potentially good ROI that radiologists and hospitals are willing to pay for, even though your algorithm may not get written up in Forbes magazine or article, I encourage you to look carefully at some of the use cases described in this particular article. In fact, I'm hoping more articles will come out around this topic of using AI beyond, uh, beyond image interpretation in the future expanding on some of these use cases uh, to show, you know, more clinical, operational, and financial benefits. Now, the article concludes by discussing the symbiosis of AI and radiology. Although the article didn't say it explicitly, it does describe briefly the black box problem. For example, meaning people don't know how a particular deep learning model comes to its decision. I once asked a group of panelists what they thought about the black box problem, and the responses range from what a big issue it is in healthcare to how we have the biggest black box between our years, and people seem to be okay with it. Now, last year, um, Paris did uh, refer to this particular article briefly in his presentation. There was a research paper looking at Watson deciding whether to give contrast or not on the NSKMRI exams. The author could not figure out why Watson was wrong when it was when it made a mistake. So even though it had really high accuracy, they decided not to implement it in clinical practice. Why? Because we humans, while you know we may make more mistakes ourselves, are perhaps hypocritically far less tolerant when a machine makes a mistake, especially when we don't know, you know, why or how. So. 
The Pearson Group's article concludes nicely how machine learning has the potential to improve patient care, how it can go beyond imaging interpretation to improve efficiency and utilization of radiology practices, how a symbiosis can lead to better care than that provided by either one alone, either AI by itself or the radiologist by, by herself. And finally, how we should implement these today to better prepare for tomorrow, which I totally agree with. So overall, I find this article to address a very important aspect of AI and radiology today that I think many of us should pay attention to. And I hope this article will encourage those of us doing AI and radiology to work on use cases beyond image interpretation. And that's it for me. Uh, so I guess uh, we'll just op start opening up to Q&A. At this time. Thank you so much for really amazing presentations. I've actually been taking notes myself, you know, uh, things that I hadn't really thought about. And <clears throat> at this point, uh, please type your questions in, um, in the questions chat and I'm going to read them out for you. And we also have some points of discussion that, you know, uh, Dr. Paras and Dr. Wujin suggested for discussion too. So James Condon, uh, welcome back. Uh, Dr. Lakani, for CT to virtual PET by huge training set, can you give us a ballpark? Are we talking about 10,000 patients? Thanks. Oh, I'm, this is all theory, I have no idea, but like, so like if you, um, I mean, I, I read the paper and if you look at some examples um, and, and from some other papers I've read, uh, what ends up happening is, is that it tends to, um, I guess the, the synthetic PET exams really resemble the training data. Um, so if in your training data, for example, like if there are nodules in the right upper lobe that are all cold, then you get a new scan, right? And then if there's a nodule in the right upper lobe, it's just gonna presume it to be cold because all the, all the stuff in the training data was cold, but the real PET might be hot. So the problem with GANs and the problem with making virtual pets, it's only as, it, it can only resemble the training data distribution. But in real life, we know we see cases, I mean, I, I always see rare cases, and um, we all see unusual cases, or we see examples that are so, somewhat different. But it is an interesting concept, and so I don't know that answer, because for this study, I don't think they used that many. I think they used, the, they just did it off of probably a few hundred scans. And the reason why they use so few is they're training it on a slice by slice basis. So, you know, a few hundred scans, each scan has a couple hundred slices, that's tens of thousands of images, and then with augmentation they get it higher. So you can actually create an autoencoder. But um I think I think if you wanted to see something like this in real life work really well, I think you need a, a quite a bit of data. But the use cases, you know, maybe in tumor board, you want to see what the SUV was on a, on a lymph node. Could you use this? I don't know. It'd be really interesting, but um, uh, I'd have a little bit of worry, you know, unless it was trained on a huge, huge volume. Awesome. Uh, um, okay, Steve has two comments. <laughs> Oparas, don't get me started about augmentation, but he... <laughs> uh, yeah, so he said, uh, hello, everyone. So um, one, as more questions come in, I'm going to uh, go back to other questions that we had thought we can discuss. I think the first one is, you know, how do you get to gain expertise in AI as a radiologist? You know, I think this question comes up, you know, should you be working on Python? Should you be learning how to code? You know, are we going to see different levels of, um specialists you know what would be a good return on investment you know for technical people and also non-technical people i think that would be an interesting question to hear uh from both of you sure i'll go first and then Paris, you can uh, uh chime in afterwards so this is actually a question i get asked quite often you know people are you know always attend an ai talk uh, and then afterwards they ask you know, you know how do i learn more about this topic now, there are several things you can do. First, you can attend conferences and attend sessions in AI, as well as read articles like this one. In fact, um, I know Judy mentioned it earlier, in March, there was a special issue in JACR that was dedicated to artificial intelligence. Second, you can set up Google Alerts. That's what I do, uh, so you can keep up with the news. I spend time every morning reading up on all the latest articles and news on this particular topic, for example. 
sir, there are many of us who tweet about this topic, and you can follow us um, uh, to keep up up to date on this. And finally, you can take online courses on the subject. So Google, Stanford, and NVIDIA, for example, offer online courses. And speaking of NVIDIA, they have a digit D-I-G-I-T-S platform where you can use to learn hands-on, as well as create and train your, AI, your own AI models, which I've done. Also, I've taken many classes on Udemy on the subject myself, which I found extremely helpful to get a deeper understanding of the subject. So personally, I, you know, I, I've been focusing on Python uh, and Python-related um, uh, things. And last year, uh, there was a JCR article on predicting. So for example, you know, last year there was a JCR article on predicting no-shows in radiology using logistic regression. And you, know, you can actually create your own machine learning model using similar methods with, you know, uh, code less than a page long. Uh, so this is something you can definitely do. And so, you know, this is definitely a very exciting and actually quite quite a fun field. Lars? Yeah, that was great, Wujin. A lot of cool tips there. I, um, I actually, because I have such little time, and I, I think my residents have almost no time, I haven't even had a chance to take any courses, which is really bad. I would rec. I haven't taken the fast AI course, but in seven weeks, that seems like the be one of the one of the better ones to take. Um, so I just go right to GitHub, <laughs> and I look at a lot of blogs. You know what I'm saying? And and that's what I do because I feel like if I can look at code, then I can learn even faster. Um, but uh, you know, in all honesty, a lot of the stuff is moving towards graphical user interfaces, and uh, even at our institution. You know, people are talking about using Google's, you know, auto ML technology using their, I think they released an alpha version of it and it, of their API. And um, I wonder, what, I mean, I wonder if this field is moving to less coding and more of like high level abstraction on how to do this stuff. I heard um, Jeff Dean, you know, who's head of Google AI right now. Um, so their Google Translate software used to be a half a million lines of code. They switched to deep learning um, a number a few years ago, and now it's 500 lines of code, and it performs much better. So in a way, AI is less about coding <laughs> as it is about principles, but you do have to have some code involved. And I think you know if you look at um, various competitions like Kaggle, there are some really nice kernels out there um, and really nice tricks. So I, I, I've been spending mostly most of my time looking at GitHub and Kaggle competitions to learn. Awesome. So uh, James has a comment. Um, so the, the black box problem, there is Ribeiro et al. In, from University of Washington who are working on a locally interpretable model agnostic explanations or LIME to be able to work on our trust of deep learning models. And he gives a link for the archive paper, which I'll post on Twitter. Thanks, James. Um, Justin, um, he says he's brought this up on past general clouds, but it's something huge that we could really use this stuff to leverage along the lines of the Australian study on longevity prediction of chest city. Who else is working on predictive and prescriptive analytic side of AI? And what are the machine learning, deep learning, AI challenges of taking this next step from the present to what an image can tell us about a patient's future state? Do you have any comments about this? I know it's a long question. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting topic. Um, I, I mean, I haven't done too much research on any other groups doing this because I think a lot of groups right now are organizing data sets to do this um, because you kind of have to know outcomes. So just to get a large amount of data for that um, could be a little time consuming, but I would imagine that's where a lot of the interest is right now. Can you predict mortality? Can you you know, predict readmission rates. And there are articles popping up on that. I mean, if you go on Google, you can look it up. I think there was an article on hospital readmission rates using deep learning, um, which is kind of a, um, a topic that hospitals are interested in. Um, I think people are going to be using it to predict heart disease, stroke risk, uh, you know, because we have lots of predictive models based off of uh, just risk factors that we know about, for example, for heart disease, like cholesterol level, body weight. So I think you're going to see a lot of people put this into machine learning models um, and to get even uh, more accurate, you know, predictive scores. 
Okay. Um, so back to more questions. So specifically for Wooten, I think uh, I really enjoyed hearing you spoke, speak about Dr. Dreyer's 10 reasons why there's limited use of AI in clinical care. Uh, can you, do you have any other lessons that you've observed or other reasons that you've observed and how you see these other, you, you know, how you see these other use cases uh, will be able to overcome the barriers? Right, so, I mean, I really have to credit Keith Dreyer on this one. So I did mention during my presentation that, you know, he gave 10 reasons and I, I talked about two of them. The other reasons that he mentions, um, you know, in his, one of his talks um, are things like poorly defined use cases, which actually ACR is tackling because they have created within the uh, Data Science Institute um, these multiple committees uh, uh, separated by uh, subspecialty. So for example, I'm on the NSK use case committee where we're trying to find better, you know, uh, come up with use cases for these AI companies. And, uh, you know, there's lack of, for example, standards for clinical integration. Uh, clinical integration, I think, is, uh, is an important part of uh, bringing these AI technologies into real life, uh, which we can talk about a little bit more later. Um, there is difficulty with training data set creation. Um, I think if you notice, uh, there was an interesting article in Radiology today, you know, a couple months ago, where, you know, if you look at the AI models that are out there right now for, let's say, image interpretation, uh, we have those models because we have the training data sets. So that's why you constantly see pulmonary nodules, you constantly see brain bleeds and brain tumors and, and, and so forth. But if you really look, you know, we have them because we have a data set. And this, you know, uh, difficulty with creating training data set is, is definitely a limitation. And there's also limitations in UI and user interface. Um, there are also problems with inconsistent results and, um, you know, between models. Um, and the inference models um, tend to be brittle. Uh, you know, you, you take one model and it works great in one data set and you take another one, uh, you bring it to another hospital and it may not work exactly as well. And there's limited use in healthcare and, and overall poor acceptance. Um, so those are, you know, some of the uh, some of the reasons that you know Dr. Dreyer gives as far as why there is uh, limited use of AI in, in clinical uh, care. Now I can tell you that um, you know take one example from Paris's article. You know patient no-show rate prediction. Um, it, that's one you know for example use case that that doesn't necessarily have the kind of limitations a lot of these AI models uh, use for imaging as a patient base. Okay. Uh, Dr. Paras, do you have any comments? I know. Um... Um, no, I think Wujin, you did a great job answering that. Nothing beyond what I think Wujin had to say for that question. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, I think Steve comments that uh, one fantastic application would be use, which would be useful for us to implement is automatic translation of radiology reports to other languages. Uh, you know, Spanish, Creole, you know, and shouldn't be too hard to implement. And I think that's an excellent, excellent um, suggestion because uh, I know some radiologists who read in English uh, for, you know, offsites in developing countries who, who cannot get enough radiologists and, you know, you read it in English, but you, you know, the, the doctors on the ground, you know, probably, uh, understand Creole or French, and uh, you know there's obviously things that are lost in translation. So definitely, that's a low-hanging fruit, especially when everyone says they're building these systems for developing countries. Okay, so um, I think you know it's a little bit cliche coming at this time because we've been doing this general club for several uh, five months now. But do you think radiologists will be replaced? I think it's always an interesting question to ask. Yeah. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle this first and then Paris, you can uh, add to it. So this is definitely a popular topic in radiology today. Pretty much every conference you attend today, there'll be some session on, uh, you know, artificial intelligence and at least one of them, uh, one of the sessions, if not more, will talk about whether AI will replace radiologists or not. The fear factor, as I call it, began with 
you know, the AI experts like Jeffrey Hinton, the so-called the father of deep learning, who has famously said we should stop training radiologists. Unfortunately, this type of statement has caused hype that has led to some medical students not going into radiology and having many of us in the field worry about being replaced. Someone recently made a joke about, I won't say who, how he has already seen the future, there is no radiologist in Star Trek. Look, I don't know what's going to happen in the distant future, but it is my personal opinion that AI won't be replacing radiologists anytime soon. And here are some of the reasons. First, the radiologists do far more than interpret images, as I've shown you through the image and value chain example. You see, this is an important point that I think many so-called AI experts don't realize. What if I were to tell you that just because I created a robot that can feed babies, change diapers, and read them stories, that I have created something that can replace mothers everywhere? Well, I'm sure mothers would certainly appreciate such help. I think you will not only immediately know that I don't have any kids of my own, but you would dismiss me pretty much right away, right? And it's no different from what these AI experts are saying. This is why I get annoyed when I, you know, when as much as I respect their work, experts like, say, Andrew Ng, putting out tweets like he did after Stanford's AI work on chest x-rays discussed in recent AI Journal Club, you know, quote, should radiologists be worried about their job? And this type of fear mongering does not help. And there are many other reasons, but I won't go into it in detail given the time. However, you can read Hugh Harvey's uh, actually blog post title, Why AI Will Not Replace Radiologists for More, which I agree with. Now, someone at a conference recently oh, said perhaps Paras, AI replacing radiologists. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh -huh. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Wujit. I don't, I think it's going to be really tough to replace, you know, everything that we do. Um, the one concern that I have is that um, we might see a situation maybe five or ten years from now where for some types of imaging exams that are done, say, in an outpatient office, um, where non-radiologists will sign off on the on the reports, you know, assuming that these reports are, let's say, it's for an MRI of the spine, like a specific, you know, modality, um, and the way our healthcare system is designed with self-referral, that you know, vendors might take advantage of some of these. Um, non-radiologists and sell them imaging equipment and say, hey, just sign off on the report. Your friend's doing it across the street, you know, and over time, I just don't know if that's a slippery slope and where AI could increase costs and increase unnecessary studies from self-referral. So that's like one fear that I have um, with AI, but I agree. A lot of what we do in radiology, even in image interpretation, requires thought. I mean, some of these cases are really hard. Um, we had an AI vendor come to our shop recently, and this is like a big company. And I think even behind the scenes, the vendors understand the limitations with even current deep deep learning technology. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of what we do in image interpretation that, that humans can do, trained humans can do, that are still going to be difficult for machines. Um, but, you know, it's really hard to predict 20 years from now. But I, if I had to make a bet, I would, I would bet we would still be around. Um, and hopefully, hopefully we'll start to see some of these solutions actually come into our practice, which is which which is what I'm more excited about because you know a lot of our work is monotonous and boring, and I kind of do want to see that replaced a little bit. Yep, I agree. Yeah. So I know we're coming to the top of the hour, but uh, I'm going to ask one last question, and as you answer it, you can also uh, maybe you know just give us something that. Um, uh, I'll let you decide what you want to tell the audience. Uh, either the work that you're excited to work on right now or a challenge that you're facing or something you recently learned. Uh, and uh, so as an institution, you know, let's say you're approaching a new institution and you want to think about, you know, working in the AI space as, you know, I think we have a lot of members in the audience who are informaticians. What, you know, what would you be looking at in this institution? You know, how do you um, fashion out a career around AI? Should you even be doing that? Is it advisable to do something like that? And, uh, you know, how do you write your story when it comes to AI? Because these things are moving so fast. I mean, archive is full of new articles every day. You know, it's a little actually exhausting to try and keep up. So I want to hear your thoughts about that. And um, also when you're done, you can just, you know, 
uh, give your last parting shots because we are at the top of the hour. Hi, Paul. Um, sure, I, I can start with that. I think, um, yeah, it's really hard to keep up with the literature. There's so many people working in this field. I would say, you know, go with um, what you're passionate about. And if there's a particular aspect of radiology that you really enjoy, um, try to think of how you can use AI to improve that. I think um, if you're working with AI on anything that's non-image interpretation based, I think there's um, quite a bit of opportunity there because we don't see as many publications in that in that domain, and, and especially with like radiology reporting. Um, so certainly those are avenues, uh, but there's always need for more people working in the space. I think even though there's a lot of publications, uh, there's still a lot of interest and uh, journals are hungry for this type of stuff. So, um, you know, I would just encourage people to collaborate and, and work with uh, uh, friends and colleagues and uh, just uh, don't get dissuaded by the volume of uh, studies that you see out there. And. Um... So I agree with her. So um, I'll just give, uh, I'll just end with just one last, you know, quote unquote advice. Um, I think if you're working in this area of artificial intelligence, whether you're a startup or, you know, you're doing research, I think one of the things that is very important to think about is how to integrate AI into the actual workflow. Because if it's not seamless, then it really won't be used by the radiologist. And someone recently told me that when AI, AI works, it is no longer called AI. For example, you know, there are many AI technologies in your smartphone, but we don't call it an AI phone or we don't, you know, say we carry around an AI device, right? So similarly, this technology has to be so well integrated into our workflow that it is practically yeah. invisible. So that's one of the things that I would, um, you know, uh, I would, uh, as a parting advice. Okay. okay. Um, well, I'm going to thank everyone, especially our panelists, for an amazing, amazing talk. Uh, please join us at the ACR Resident and Fellows section. Um, you know, coming up, if you meet us on the corridor, please let's talk about this top. I think we should have enough energy and discussions. And I'm going to send out an email about our next talk. We're still deciding whether we'll have one given the ACR week or we should skip the May one. And so, um, as always, please uh, leave your feedback. And I want to thank the panelists again, Dr. Paras and Dr. Bujian, for availing their time to be on this journal club. And thank you, Catherine, for helping us facilitate. She's our ACR liaison staff. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.